There's probably <laughs> no strike more ubiquitous with karate than the reverse punch. It's karate's answer to boxing straight right, or the straight left if you're a southpaw, or a cross if you're a normal person. And while they are similar punches, I do think they're very different in not only how they're done, but also how they should be used. So in today's video, I'm gonna show you guys how to do the reverse punch, as well as how I implement it in my full contact sparring. But before we do that, make sure you're subscribed and you have notifications turned on. That way you never miss a new video. So let's talk about the superficial differences between the cross and the reverse punch. Typically, and this is not always the case, when you throw the cross, you get here in your stance, drive through the ground, rotate through your hips, push to the back, extend your hand, and come back to position. Again, I'm here. If you need to move forward when you throw the cross, typically you'll take a shuffle step, one, two, and then come back. Again, here. Now, the biggest difference with the reverse punch is that instead of having my hands up here by my face, it tends to be done with the hands down low. Once again, you push through the legs and rotate through the back, but the hands chamber back to your hips or chest, depending on what style you're doing, rather than protecting your head. You're throwing the same punch with your hands down low that you are with your hands up top. The benefit of keeping your hands down low is that the opposite hand is pulling your body across. Now, some people will say this is giving you more whip and more power in the punch. I don't know necessarily that I agree with that, only because I've seen people throw a devastating cross while keeping their hands up, and I've seen people throw wimpy punches with their hands down low. So I think that really comes down more to your ability to generate power, not so much your ability to pull your hand down at your chest. However, there is something to talk about with keeping the hands down at the chest, and we'll talk about that later. But I don't think that's the main difference between the cross and the reverse punch. I think ultimately the difference is in how the footwork works. The first thing you want to talk about is your stance. Now, you can totally blitz from a narrow tie style stance, but I find that I get a lot more ground covered if I widen my stance. Naturally, I'm already taking up more space and I can push much harder off this back leg and my front leg to go towards my opponent. Second thing I wanna pay attention to is my rear heel. Now, once again, you can move with flat feet. No one's saying you can't, but I find that I get more spring if I keep that rear heel raised. Firstly, that keeps my weight centered towards the front, which is where I'm wanting to go, and it allows me to push off the ball of my foot with accuracy, with coordination, and with balance. I'm using my rear leg like a spring. I'm here in my stance. I've got my heel raised. My weight is sitting in between my legs, and I've got a little bit of a bounce going. Once I find my weight sit back on my right leg, now I've got all this potential energy on that back foot, and I just use that to spring forward and then spring right back. Again, I'm here, moving back and forth, boom, and back. Now, why do I wanna do the blitzing style footwork? That's easy. When I'm here with my opponent in a traditional range, I only have to take a single step to hit him. Either I reach in with my lead foot or I'm already in range, don't have to take a step at all. And it's safe to assume that once I'm out of that range, he doesn't have to worry about me hitting him, right? Wrong, because that's where the blitzing footwork comes from. So from here, any reasonable person would assume they're safe. They would assume they'd have to see me step towards them before I land my strikes. And that's gonna give them time to react. But if I'm good at that blitzing style footwork, I can use this back leg to shoot in and back. Again, I'm here. <coughs> so I'm using this blitzing footwork to shoot from a long or out of range zone into range so I can land my power shot. Now, obviously, depending on the strength of your legs, you might not have a lot of power from this range. I might just be tapping my opponent from here. And if we're talking point karate, that's great. You earned yourself a point. But if you wanna do some damage, rather than being way out here, you can also be slightly out of range and still <coughs> deliver a pretty powerful punch. I cut so I can put on my gloves and represent the brand. These are some of my favorite MMA sparring gloves. If you wanna get a pair just like it, head on over to combatcorner.com, use this code right here for 10% off your order. I promise you won't regret it. Anyway, notice that when I throw the punch, my center of gravity is staying more or less in between my legs. The instinct here is to get more range by leaning forward when you throw your punch. And while that's not always the worst thing, it can be the worst thing. Try, as always, to keep control of your center of gravity. So as you spring forward, you keep your weight in between both legs. Yes, leaning forward gets you closer to your opponent, but it also gets your face closer to your opponent. And the reverse punch is kind of an all or nothing strike. If I commit too much to this punch and I miss, now my head's way closer to my opponent, and if he steps left or right out of the way, I'm gonna get countered. So keep your defensive stance, keep your head in between your legs, 
and don't overextend yourself. But I promised we'd talk about that chambering hand, the opposite hand coming back to the chest. What's the point of doing that? Does it really add more power? Mm, I tend to think no, but I don't think it adds nothing. I think what chambering your hand allows you to do is get more length out of your punching side. What I mean is, if I'm here and I wanna throw my punch and I pull my lead hand back to my face, this is how far I am. I'm missing by one to two inches. But if I let this hand pull down to the side, now I'm exposing more of my shoulder and hitting my target. Now, I don't necessarily need to pull my hand all the way down to my chest. I can also pull it here. All I'm doing is pulling the shoulder back, but this is a cue that I need to over rotate to reach my target. Again, if I need to get more range, I'm not gonna do it by leaning forward over my strike. Instead, I'm gonna rotate more to expose more of my shoulder. A minor difference, but an important one, between the cross and the reverse punch is when you actually extend the hand. Typically, when you throw the cross, it happens after the lower body moves, meaning I rotate through the legs, through the hips, and through the back, and then I extend my punch. The last thing to move is technically my hand. The punch starts from the ground, and as the kinetic chain reaches my arm, that's when I extend the hand. Now, you don't do that with the reverse punch, because instead of letting my legs lead the movement, I'm actually traveling in with my hand ahead of my movement. If I wait till I land before I throw the punch, yes, it'll still be a pretty good cross, but if my opponent sees me moving towards him, I might get clipped on the way in. So try your best to land the reverse punch right as your feet stop moving. Okay guys, so everything I just said is awesome and perfect as always, but obviously throwing a single strike and lunging towards your opponent has a lot of risk. If I miss this one shot, I'm in danger of my opponent countering me. So it's always better to throw punches and bunches or bunches and punches, whatever way it's supposed to be. So instead of diving in with only the reverse punch, I'm gonna open it with a jab. Now, the footwork is gonna stay the exact same. I'm gonna be here in my long range. I'm gonna push off the back leg, but now instead of traveling with my rear hand, I'm gonna travel with my lead hand. I'm using my jab as the traveling strike. Once I land, I'm still gonna throw a reverse punch, but now it's gonna look a lot more like a cross. Again, I'm here. <coughs> Another way you could do this is even when you're in the long range, flash out the jab. Your opponent doesn't have to actually get hit with this punch, he just has to react to it. So, from this long range, I throw my jab in place, then I dive in with my reverse punch. Again, I'm here. <laughs> this is a good time to talk about why you would throw the back fist versus the jab. In general, if my hands are up nice and high, I'm gonna default to the jab. Reason being, it's more natural to push off the back foot and extend my hand straight forward like a piston from this position, rather than flinging it out like I was throwing a back fist. But, if I have my hands down low, now suddenly my jab has to look more like an up jab. Or if I wanna make it more natural, I just turn it into a back fist. So it really depends on where you're holding your stance. If you keep your hands down low, your jabs might end up being back fists. But if your hands are up high, you'll probably end up throwing a jab. Although of course, everything being modifiable, you can also throw back fists from here. Nothing is permanent ever. So we've learned how to blitz in when we throw our strikes. We've learned that when we stop moving, that's when we land the reverse punch. But as with everything, what goes forward must come back up, just like puking. So let's say I throw the best jab reverse punch of all time, but I'm gonna assume I haven't killed my opponent and he's gonna wanna hit me again. I'm now gonna need to retreat away from my opponent. The dumb thing to do is to move straight back in a line because even the worst trained fighter of all time will generate momentum as they march you down. And eventually as I run away, I'm gonna run into something. So I'm gonna now take an angle as I move away from my opponent. What I mean is I'm here, I go in jab reverse punch and instead of moving backwards, I'm gonna step off at a 45, making sure that I'm not so far away from my opponent that I have to step back in to throw my counter. I'm maintaining control of the range and that is the true strength of karate. It's not about powerful one shot, one kill punches, it's about maintaining angles and putting your opponent in a position where he can't hit you, but you can hit him. Last thing we're gonna talk about today is the retreating reverse punch, which might sound a little confusing given that the reverse punch is supposed to be a diving forward punch, and it's still that, but now we're gonna invite our opponent towards us and then meet them in the middle with the reverse. So I'm gonna do the dumb thing that I told you guys not to do. I'm going to run away from my opponent. 
I wanted to get cocky thinking I'm running away scared. Then once I plant my back foot, I'm gonna spring forward, intercept him with the reverse punch. What I want you to notice is that I'm using my lead hand as a feeler. As soon as he's out of range as my lead hand, that's when I spring in with the reverse punch. Again, I'm here, I spring back, boom. Again, I'm here, I step back. All right guys, there you go. There was everything you could possibly wanna know about the reverse punch. Now, ultimately when it comes down to performing this, you might not be able to tell if you're doing a cross or a reverse punch, and really it doesn't matter. But when you're practicing, it is important to know what the different tools you have in your arsenal. And I think the reverse punch is one that is pretty well utilized, but also not well recognized. So hopefully this is something you can add to your own personal training. And if not, I don't know why you watch the whole video. But if you feel like you got something out of this, if you feel like you learned something, and if you're looking for a channel that combines the practicality of combat sports with the reality of self-defense and the fun of traditional martial arts, then please be sure to subscribe, tap the notification bell, like, share, and leave a comment. And if you're looking to pick up some official combat self-defense merch, head on over to combatsd.square.site where we have t-shirts, tank top, coffee mugs, maybe a hoodie if I finally get around to that, anything you could possibly want to support the channel. This has been Rob from Combat Self-Defense. I want to thank you guys for all the hard work. Thank you for the hard work yet to be done, and I'll see you next time.